Good morning to the people in the room. For those of you that I've not met, I'm Dominic Campbell of Creative Agent International, and I'm part of the team that have made Creative Brain Week. And uh, all of this week, so yesterday, today, and tomorrow, we uh, start with a, a very casual reflection session, a kind of coffee session, I suppose. Um, partly reflecting on themes from yesterday or themes that are generally bubbling up in the air. And for that, I'm joined by Autumn Brown and Chris Bailey. Looking very casual. Yeah. <laughs> um, so maybe we'll start uh, thoughts that are echoing in your mind from yesterday. Things that are, as we enter, as we, so yesterday was about conflict. Tomorrow is about joy. Today we think of as the bridge, imagination between conflict and joy. And Chris, you were thinking you had some thoughts on the... <laughs> well, I always have thoughts. Uh, I, if I had to choose one to start with as a bridge to today, I think it would be the, the section on forecasting that we saw yesterday, trying to predict where conflict is most likely to arise in order to prevent it and therefore have the prediction not be true. Um, and it, what, what interests me about that session is we heard uh, in very eloquent detail why forecasting is more often than not wrong. Um, and and a, as I was listening, I kept waiting for the, and here is the technique that will work, that will <laughs> forecast. And of course, it never came. Uh, and. And that is what actually fascinated me, uh, was this narrative in our species of the need to try and tell the future. Uh, and it, it reminded me of uh, Carl Jung, the Swiss psychologist, who was famously obsessed with horoscopes. And much to the chagrin of his colleagues. And one of them came up to him once and said, you know, Carl, uh, what is this thing? Uh, you don't really believe in horoscopes, do you? And he says, well, of course not, but people believe in them. Mm. And so therefore it's worthy of study. Yeah. And, and I thought about my position at WHO, uh, even my visual impairment, there's this assumption that we know something more that we're not telling. Mm. Right? Yeah. So at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, w you know, when, whenever there's a health crisis, uh, an accident, uh, a misfortune, we have this need for information that is up here, and the available information is down here. And so our, our scavenging ancestor past comes in where with the absence of information, we, we begin to look for faint patterns and just extrapolate the, on them randomly. And that's how misinformation gets started. That's, that's why um, there's backlash at the people who are expected to know the future but don't have the information yet, that sort of thing. And, yeah. and in, in my, my blindness, there's this folk tradition that blind people are supposed to know the future, you know, the, the blind yeah, seer. The seer. Yeah, and in fact, I can predict the future with 100% accuracy, but only with past events. Yes. And <laughs> so, um, but, but, but to bring these thoughts to a close, uh, what interests me is that at a certain point, uh, 70,000 years ago, at the midpoint of our brief life as a species, there was this thing called the midbrain revolution that happened, where we developed the ability to imagine things that don't exist in nature. It went beyond just simply the rodent in the field trying to find faint patterns to slightly improve their ability to find food or escape danger, which, by the way, studies in the 1950s on that directly influence the way grocery stores are structured to appeal to our scavenging instincts. Um, uh, that um, at that point 70,000 years ago, we could actually consciously, instead of project an image, imagine an image. And so when you put that into a state of danger and uncertainty, um, instead of just grasping at a faint image and hoping it's true, you could actually imagine a way forward and then start to plan how we could make that a reality. And hope then becomes a creative act. So as a carnivalist, that is 
my normal language. You put on the costume because you can imagine that you can become the other person. That's right. You literally, in some form of imaginative uh, strategy, become that. You move between worlds. And Autumn, that's kind of why you're here. Because <laughs> you move between worlds quite a lot. You tell people a little bit about what you're doing. Well, I uh, just mm. uh, got yeah. through my Viva, actually. So I'm glad that's over. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, freshly rested. Um, but I use art and science to look at the way that our relationship with science has been evolving over time, really, really rapidly. So through a series of critical case studies, I looked at an art science exhibition touring during the pandemic. I looked at, as well, um, a creative algorithmic justice and creative storytelling program that we were working with on with people uh, living in direct provision. If you don't know what direct provision is, it is housing um, in really, really inhumane conditions for people who are seeking protection here in Ireland. And so we did that virtually also during the pandemic. And the final case study, um, well, I did work on, it's, it's still so fresh, uh, was looking at a different way to generate data with learners or with participants. So a lot of times, you know, we use things like focus groups or surveys or interviews. And those sorts of things can feel really extractive. We are all, I think everybody is creative and the way that we engage with things like science are really, really, really personal. And some of the topics that we were touching on are so complex, are so broad, are so personal that things like surveys and interviews just aren't going to allow the people that we're working with to really, really communicate their experience and how they feel about these topics. So uh, I had the privilege of prototyping um, a new methodology over six weeks, actually, when this was Science Gallery. This was my living laboratory. This is where I did all that work. And we used zines, which are small DIY booklets, which can contain poetry, collage, all sorts of text and all sorts of visual data, but also different sorts of origami there's all of these different ways that you can make these DIY booklets and we used them in 19 EU nations to reflect on what science meant to these individuals. And it was really, really extraordinary to see, you know, just how uh, the breadth of reflection that we received in those zines. And I, there were two actually that we were working with in Greece um, at a, an organization called uh, LATRA which deals primarily with folks who are also seeking protection and who land in Greece. And there were two uh, women who really, really wanted to participate um, in the zines, were incredibly creative, um, but had up until that point felt quite uh, reticent participating in some of these science workshops that were happening at LATRA uh, because they couldn't read or write. And they took this opportunity to make some of the most extraordinarily deep, reflective, just shocking zines I've ever seen. And not only did they make them as individuals, but made them as a community, as a group of people, um, which was just incredible to see. And it was really, really um, just humbling and reminded me that, you know, science isn't just a way for us to understand the world. It is a way for us to make the world, to re-engage with it, and to build relationships with it in many, many, many different ways. And the language of science isn't something that's just textual. It's not numerical. It can be so much more than that. Uh, so that's a little bit of my I think you research. see a lot of that. It's, it's interesting listening to you, so I'm thinking about the living lab sessions. So for those of you who weren't here yesterday, we start with reflections, then we do about two hours of presentation, lots of information. And then we realized last year that people have different pedagogies, have different learning styles to process information in different ways. And so we invented the living labs. So from about 12.15 until lunch, about one, there is a youth theater session outside of the door. There is a Eliza Scrib and one boy Karanja running a visual arts piece, which really echoes exactly what you're talking about, collecting visual information. It also echoes the way that churches communicated in the 14th century by image-driven pieces. Upstairs, there's a piece on dance for those of you that have sat still far too long by lunchtime. Really recommend the dance piece. Uh, but it, it also, I think, your story reflects um, how measurement can actually influence uh, mm. the 
uh, the situation and, and maybe even cause harm. Absolutely. Uh, uh, I remember working with a group and I, I asked to review the survey instrument. And one of the questions was, uh, have you experienced extreme trauma? If so, please describe. <laughs> Enjoy reliving that experience. And, and uh, it's one of the reasons why yesterday, uh, when my colleague uh, Nisha and, and Nils uh, talked a little bit about our work with uh, the Yazidi Cultural Archive, um, I, I felt it necessary to, to point out that this wasn't about uh, hiring a professional photographer to catalog uh, the cultural aspects of what these women tragically lost, mm. uh, uh, to do so would have been putting them at the receiving end of the camera again and objectifying them once again. And, uh, and, and it's one of the reasons why WHO's participation was sort of predicated on the fact that we give them the cameras, we, we give them the choice. And what was then discovered, I think, were things that, first of all, uh, I don't think even a professional cameraman would have thought to ask. Yeah. But then secondly, the project was not about what happened to them or the perpetrators. Uh, it was about rebuilding their relationships to um, their culture to each other to themselves and and trying to use creativity and imagination to literally make their bodies a safe place again for their spirits to return to it it, it was um, it, it was not an act of preservation it was an act of transformation and I think, too, a lot of times these instruments that are meant to capture an experience or better understand an experience of patients, of learners, of people in general, it feels extractive. You make somebody feel like a data bucket that you're just coming in as a researcher, or as data a person ID. just... <laughs> yeah, that you're just scooping it out or taking, taking, taking. And what we really wanted to do, what I really wanted to do as a researcher, is find a way to generate data with a participant, with a learner, with a patient. Do it in such a way as it really, really makes it explicit that the data generated belongs first and foremost to the generator, to the participant, to the learner, to the patient, not to me. It is my privilege, should you choose to share it with me, to, to hear that story or to see that story just for a moment. But ultimately, and this was something that we did, we wrote facilitation guides because I it was all during the pandemic and I couldn't travel to 19 EU nations. So it was all done virtually and made a guide that was sent out to, for facilitators to use. And it was absolutely integral that all of our participants understood that that zine, this thing that you made, that belongs to you. No one's going to take it away. We'll photograph it should you choose to let us do that. But in a lot of cases, we also gave the camera to the learner to let them photograph it themselves and to share with us in the way that they chose to what their story was. Well, it kind of boils down to... Uh and, and you know, when we talk about arts and health in the WHO context, uh, on the one level, it's nothing new. We've been using arts for health promotion since our inception in 1948. Uh, uh, but the problem with health promotion, uh, as evidence-based and as effective as it can be in changing health behaviors to something more health positive, hmm. It's fundamentally about us deciding what someone else should do and using the arts to manipulate them to do what we have already decided they should be doing. Mm. And so there, there's an inherent, uh, dare I say it, colonial attitude there yeah. uh, that we've predetermined what's good for you. Uh, what we're talking about is the opposite. Uh, and I go back to, again, my friend Carl Jung, uh, <laughs> Swiss, Swiss um, uh, who, who said loneliness is not the absence of people. Loneliness is the inability to express what matters to you most. Mm -hmm. So in everything that we do, it's not about um, uh, creating art to get you to do something. It, it's a, it, well, it gets back to the, it, it's using art the same way the UN uh, uses a fish. Uh, we don't give you a fish, yeah. we teach you to fish. And, and that's what we're trying to do with the Arts and Health program, is to remind people and awaken in people the fact that it, it's, it's not that they should consume art in a certain way, but they are artists. Mm -hmm. They are all creative every minute. Right, it's the meaning of our own lives. Yeah. 
And two, you know, we think of, and, and so my background is in oncology research, and we were speaking about oncology just outside. And so I came leaving the sciences uh, kind of on with great purpose, really, because I feel that science has really got this... Um, this position in our society is the capital T arbiter of, of, of truth. It is the only way to really, really, truly get to the, the meat of something, the real truth, the reality. Whereas, I don't think that's true. I think there are a lot of ways to make knowledge and to ask good questions and to understand the world. And science has enormous biases, enormous blind spots. And I'll tell you why. It's because it's done by people. And now, more and more, as it's done by machines, as we work alongside machines, as we collaborate with machines, we're programming these biases into the machines that we work with. We're not getting rid of them. And I'm not saying that art is pure either. I don't believe that. I'm saying that taking a... The problem against blind spots. Yeah, I'm saying that taking multiple, multiple inroads to understand our world, to understand our universe, our place within it, to make knowledge, really, as opposed to finding it, takes a multi-pronged approach. Art, science, technology, all of these things to solve the problems or address the problems that are facing us now, we have to have, we need to use all the tools in our toolkit. And art, science, all of these things, they complement one another. Does that mean we need to train differently though? So yesterday we saw people like Dana Walrath is a medical anthropologist and also a graphic artist. Mm. And so she can draw on both sets of skills. We had people like uh, Maitika Mashkar, who is a dancer, but was a lab researcher. Uh, Anusha Mohan, um, who is a Baron Chat? I can never say it. Baron Jatta, dancer, Bollywood dancer, but also a, 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 a you know, neuroscience researcher. Mm. And so, what we're doing is starting to build new sets of amalgamated skills. Well, what, uh, when Einstein came to America, uh, to Princeton, the first public engagement he had wasn't a lecture; it was a violin recital. Yeah, and, and in uh, Switzerland, in Geneva, we have uh, just a stone's throw away from WHO, uh, the, the CERN labs uh, with the Hedron Particle Collider. And when it was first built, uh, there was, they had gathered together uh, the most advanced technology for, to explore the subatomic world, brought together the most brilliant minds in theoretical physics, and the result in the first few years was not a lot of discoveries. And when they brought in some consultants to try and analyze why, uh, they said that you, you brought in all these left-brainers, but there was nobody there to imagine the hypothesis worthy of testing. Hmm. And so they started an <laughs> arts program in order to do that. Rank Zero X Park, Big Blue, yeah. yeah. So uh, NASA in the early days, yeah. you need a space in which intelligence can connect. But then what about the growing out of that? So for instance, you sit in a place which we'll which talk about scale and globalization and, and big kind of systems. Is that purely education or is there other ways that might work? We heard a lot of stories yesterday about the power of story. Well, I think, uh uh, I, I come from a knowledge management background as well, and uh, if you were to hook it to a definition, it really is about the marriage between um, uh, explicit and implicit information. It's data and story working yeah. together. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I, I think um, uh, as long as we think of them in terms of silos, we're going to run into these traps. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if we can mainstream uh, imagination, engagement within the science curriculum, uh, and vice versa, frankly, uh, I think we'd be more nimble as a society and, and less intolerant of uh, views that don't fit our mental model. So we inherit the systems that were the dreams of our grandparents, great-grandparents? We're indoctrinated, I think, into particularly like within laboratory culture, to be a good scientist within a discipline or within a specific lab at a specific institution, you are joining a culture. And you need to understand that laboratory, that specific little bubble culture within that bubble institution, within that nation. You are 
you are learning a way of seeing the world. You are learning a way of being. And if you do the same thing always, if you stay within these little bubble worlds, it's so difficult to collaborate. It's so difficult to see things with new, new eyes. I actually spoke with a couple artists in residence who were at CERN. Um, at a conference last year, and it was just extraordinary to hear the difficulties and conversations that they had. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. The bumpy road. Uh, that was really fun to, say, to have like some pushback from some of the scientists or engineers who were like, "Why are these people here? What's the point? You know, what are you contributing?" And the con it's a metaphor. Yeah. What's what? <laughs> what are you contributing? Like, why are you here? And the, the reason they were there is to help help folks see things in a new way. Help ask better questions. They're not part of that culture. They're the people coming from the outside helping to kind of like tear things open and to create new inroads. And I'm not saying that I don't think science is valuable. I left science because I left it because I love it, because I believe it can be better, because I believe that it should be acknowledging its biases and looking for ways like this, like working with artists, like working with people who think differently, to decolonize itself, to address its issues with chauvinism, to do better, to get closer to whatever it is reality making actually means. Well, between us and the streaming audience, confidentially, <laughs> <laughs> When I was trying to sell my program at WHO, there was uh, a lot of open uh, criticism of why is WHO moving into the arts? And it was the usual sort of arguments of any spare money we have should be spent on life-saving medicines. And, uh, and the way one colleague put it is the arts are merely recreational. And I said, well, listen to that word, recreation. Mm. It's healing. And now, making a clever pun uh, isn't evidence, but uh, it, it did get him to start thinking in a different way and start questioning his assumptions of language, which is what you're talking about. When I first arrived at WHO, I was asked to uh, do a lunchtime seminar on um, uh, storytelling. Mm. And uh, I did, and the power and use of storytelling in a public health or clinical context. And, uh, about 16 people showed up. Uh, they were interested, they were very polite, um, but I don't think I, I changed their world. Uh, <laughs> and then when they asked me to do it again, I thought, well, I'll do exactly the same pedagogy, but instead I'm gonna call it narrative medicine. And the place was <laughs> packed. They, they wrote down every word. And I just framed it differently because I realized I had to change my language for yeah. that audience. And, and so uh, one of the things that I love doing now, I, I actually do these performances around the world uh, in both uh, institutions like the World Bank, but also Lincoln and Kennedy Center. You know, it's both the science uh, development as well as uh, performing arts. And I try as much as possible to have a split audience where it is equally uh, artists and scientists to, so that I can force myself to create a language that engage both at the same time. Much like the way Shakespeare, not that I'm comparing myself to Shakespeare, but he would literally write in the same couplet a line that the uh, aristocratic uh, uh, Norman descended folks uh, could appreciate, uh, multisyllabic uh, Frenchified English, and then monosyllabic Anglo-Saxon English that the groundlings in the cheap seats uh, could, could you know, get into. Like, for instance, in, in Macbeth, um, there's the scene where Macbeth comes on, on stage after killing uh, Duncan, and his hands are dripping with blood, and he's imagining that this guilt, uh, like the blood, will never wash away. There's not enough water in the world. And the way Shakespeare wrote it was, um, uh, it would transform the multitudinous oceans in Carnadine and turn the dark seas red. Both lines mean exactly the same thing, but it's a dual translation to the two audiences. So I tried to do the same thing with arts and science in, in these performances. And that alarm is to remind me that we have other things that we have to do today. What? Oh, we no. do. It's only the beginning. We're We've already gone. Oh, no. <laughs> um, Let's get a coffee. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have to go talk to radio interviews and do all sorts of things. That oh. is the 10, that is the 9.58 train. That is us on the train, uh, leaving the station. Before you go, though, because this is International Women's Day, I want to leave the last word 
to you. Um, any thoughts to set us off on our day of imagination? Be open-minded. This is an adventure for you guys. It's an adventure for us all. And there are going to be conversations and things that you see today that will be once-in-a-lifetime opportunities. So take it all in. Be as present as you possibly can. And I'll be excited to meet you all outside. Thanks. Autumn Brown, Christopher Bailey, thank you.